you have your Bible, turn to the book of Genesis with me this morning. Chapter number 1. Verse number 26. Genesis 1, 26. Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 26. God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now what you read in chapter number 1 is the general statement of the creation of mankind. Chapter number 2 gets into detail. Father, bless your holy word now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I don't know if you can imagine this morning of a time when Michael and Gabriel and the cherubim and the seraphim and all the spirit beings watched the Almighty as he reached down into the dust of the ground and he had his hands full of dirt. This dirt right here was the whole future of mankind, all the history that you've ever read about or will ever see, all of the achievements, all the inventions, all of the lives of every human being that has ever lived is nothing in the world more than a hand of, handful of dirt. It's the Almighty that's able to take dirt, handful of dirt, and turn it into what we know today as the history of mankind and the future of all of mankind as we relate to Almighty God. The Bible says that God took this dirt and He created man. He formed His body. Then He breathed into His nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. As it has been said, the breath of God became the soul of man. And that's a poetic way of saying that we have a relationship with God that is unequaled, that is unique, that is different from anything else that has ever lived or ever will live. We need to get that nailed down in our heart and soul this morning. God made man in his own image. Nowhere in the Word of God is it ever said that He made an angel or a cherubim or a seraphim in His image. So in that sense we have a marvelous, unique relationship with God. Not the body. That's not the image of God because angels have bodies. It is not in the intellect for Satan has intellect. It is not in the fact that we worship for others do worship angels, seraphim, cherubim worship. Not in the sense that we're spirit beings. For the spirit world is vast. Angels, archangels, cherubim, seraphim, watchers, principalities and powers, demons, Satan and Lucifer comprise the spirit world and no doubt may be more that we're not even conscious of this morning. So what makes man so unique? What is it about us that's, that makes us so different from all of the other creatures that live in the presence of God. There's something about us that defines mankind that is unequaled, that is, that is not to be found anywhere else among any of the creatures of Almighty God. Before I answer this question, before I make an attempt to answer it, I want to deal with a few things. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, number one, to save mankind. He came to seek and save that which is lost. He's the Savior of all the things the Lord Jesus Christ is. He is the Creator. He's Lord and Master. He paid dearly to become the Savior. It cost Him His life and his blood. So he came to save. He came to restore what Adam had lost. The first Adam lost the paradise. He lost that life that God had given him. And he lost that relationship with the Lord. And then thirdly, the Lord Jesus Christ came to make access to the Father possible. There is absolutely no access unto God the Father but through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to get that nailed down. Nor the religion, nobody else, nothing else has access to God the Father but the Son. And the Son is able to take you where no one, no thing else can do. So He came to make access to God the Father 
possible. He came into this world from the abode of God. In the book of Hebrews chapter number one is a beautiful way the scripture defines and tells us about how he came into this world. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number one, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. Note carefully who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The apostle that wrote that is making a strong, powerful statement as to the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ and where he came from. Let's get that for just a moment. He's, the Bible says that in 1 Timothy 6 that there is a light that no man can approach into. That light no man hath seen and that light no man can see. In plain words, it is a powerful, eternal, almighty light and yet it is completely invisible to the eye of a creature like you and me. But shining forth from that invisible light came a light of ray of light. A ray of light when you see a storm or you see a cloud gathering in the skies and you see the sun break through after a storm and you see the light as the rays come down. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. How many has ever seen the rays of light as they are clearly delineated as they come down to the earth? That's exactly what Hebrews 1 is saying. It is saying that from that invisible light that is almighty God as he resides in his glory, a light shined out of darkness. It shined out of the invisible world into the world that you can see. And that light is the glory of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says something else about that too in Hebrews 1, 3. It says that he is the express image of his person. Not only is he the brightness of his glory, but he's the image of his person. That word translated image, image there in Hebrews 1 is not the usual word for image that you find all over the New Testament. The usual word for image is icon. You know what an icon is. You see them hanging on the wall. It's a statue. It's something that is representative of another thing. It is a physical thing. And something thing of that nature. But the word translated image in Hebrews 1 is character. And that word character is different altogether from icon. The English word image is image, but the Greek word is icon. It is character and it means a representative, a perfect, pure duplicate of what it was, what it came forth from. In plainer words, the Lord Jesus Christ is an exact replica of the one that he came forth from in glory that you cannot see with a natural eye. Even today in our English language, when we use the word character and it came straight from this, it's the same word. When we use the word character, we use it in the sense not of what you look like. We use it in the sense of what you are, how you react how you treat people. In plain words, it's something that cannot be seen with a natural eye, but it is nonetheless a reality. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is the very image of Almighty God, shining out from the invisible world into this world. We see His light, we see His glory, and we know that He is God Almighty represented among men. Here's what He said. In John 12, 45, he said, He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. In John 14, 9, he said, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? The Lord Jesus Christ cannot be diminished. He cannot be diminished. You cannot diminish his name or his person. If you, if you take him down just one step in any sense, of the word. You have completely destroyed the image of God and the Godhead as he relates to mankind. Christ is above all. There's nothing to be compared with him. He is one and one only. He's unique in himself. None before him. None after him. The Lord Jesus Christ is everything there is. So God making himself known to mankind 
like a ray of light shining out of glory. He comes down. Christ makes the invisible visible. He makes the darkness light. He comes into us where we can understand who and what he is. In 1 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 6, 1 Timothy 1 and verse number 6, chapter number 6, 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse number 16, your Bible says this, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, when he gives his testimony about what he had been, where he came from, and how God had rescued him and changed his life, he bust forth in praise to God. And here's what he said. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The Apostle Paul had just said right before that, that I am a pattern for them that should hereafter believe on him. In other words, the grace of God was working in my life. And he says over here in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, he's wisdom. It is the wisdom of God in the way that I was saved so that you'll understand that it makes no difference of how fallen you are, how low you are, how bad you are. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men through our Lord Jesus Christ, able to do above and beyond all that we even ask or think. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, this light shining out of the darkness, shining into this world, in other words, a light that comes from the invisible light and now is made visible where we can see, comprehend, understand, coming down to our level, God becoming a man. The Lord Jesus Christ was the God-man, God becoming man to walk among men so that he could go to the cross and die for men. Here is God speaking from eternity, from in his invisible state down to where we are. He came, my friend, to this world to restore the image of God in man. When Adam sinned, he lost that image. He fell, but his fall was so far and so deep that words cannot describe it. Not only did he fall into sin, but he fell away from what he had been. Not only did he fall into condemnation, but he fell from his exalted state. When God took dirt and made the image of man in a body and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the image became a very living human being, this one that had come from the dust of the ground and Michael and Gabriel stood in awe and marveled at how from dirt this creature now stands and then watched him sin and watched him fall. No doubt it had gone through their mind. Now what's God going to do with this fallen creature? He begins to manifest his wisdom. Do you serve a God this morning that is all wise? Raise your hand. Has he ever had a thought come to him in a reaction to something. No, friend, known unto God are all of his works. Glory to him. Forever glory to him. Forever wisdom. Eternal wisdom. And the one that I know this morning I serve knew me before I was ever me. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ came to restore the image of God in man. In 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now the plain sense of that statement is this, that when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, it had something to do with our new birth. And when he arose from the dead, it had something to do with our new birth as it related to God. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, the second man, the last Adam. The first man was the, of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And not only was he the second man, he was the last Adam. The first Adam gave you your life. You die in the first Adam. The last Adam is the Lord from heaven that gives you eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Being the last Adam, therefore he becomes the source, the fountainhead of all new life. The Lord Jesus Christ becomes the spring, the Gihon, bursting forth, giving life forever 
everything that will live into eternity in the future. Nothing can exist outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Without him, there is no eternal life. Without him, there is no future. Without him, there's nothing but death. The Lord Jesus Christ is the very personification of life itself. So when he came into this world, he came to bring life to man that man had lost in the garden. The first man, Adam, lost it. The last Adam gave it back. But what the first Adam lost does not rise to what the last Adam gives us. For what the last Adam gives us is of a higher order, a higher nature, a higher calling glory to God than what that first Adam could ever give us. So the Bible says in the book of Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. That word translated person in Hebrews chapter number 1 verse number 3 literally means the essence of God. That's what it means. The King James translators had to find a word to translate hypostasis. They had to hunt high and low to figure out how am I going to translate this. So they simply said person. In plain words, the person of God the Father, the essence of God the Father is shown forth in the Son. There's no stronger statement in all the Bible of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Any man that denies his deity doesn't know him. You can talk about serving God, keeping his commandments, and all of this all you want to. But if you do not exalt the Lord Jesus Christ to the place of Godhood at the very right hand of God the Father. You know nothing of the Son of the living God. So the Bible says in the book of John that he, if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. So now the Lord Jesus Christ is the very image of God, but he's going to give to us that image. We need that image. You say, preacher, I'm satisfied with being saved. Salvation is just the beginning. You need to understand that's a wonderful thing. If you've been born again, hallelujah to God, you started. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. What he did, he started, and he doesn't quit easily. Make no mistake about it. If you know him and he knows you, your life is no longer your life. It's his life. Amen. For to me to live, Paul said, is Christ, and to die is gain. He's going to give to us something so Sorely needed. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 8, verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Colossians 3.10 says, And we have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Then in the book of 2 Corinthians 3.18, Scripture says, But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. How many of you know in your soul that your destiny is much, much higher than simply a place? How many of you understand, my friend, that heaven is not a place, it's a person? How many of you realize, my friend, that in Christ we will be, that we have been accepted in the beloved, and that's who I am and where I am, and that's where I'll be forever? Places are created things. Christ is not created. God the Father exists and has existed from everlasting to everlasting. He can create millions of places. It is God's light that I want to see one day that cannot be seen. I want to be able to approach that one that is unapproachable. I want to be able to comprehend what my senses can't even imagine now, but I'll be put in a state where I can comprehend that. So the Bible says in the book of 2, 1 Corinthians 15, 49, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now let's look at man. Now that we have a good understanding concept of who Christ is and why he came, let's look at man. There's something in man that can respond to God unlike any other. There's something God put in you when he breathed into you that nothing else has. You find nowhere in the Bible where he ever breathed into an angel. You find nothing in scripture about breathing into a cherubim or a seraphim. But he breathed into man. The very breath of God that came forth from God himself was the very essence of what you became. 
I want you to get a hold of that this morning. There's something about a man that only God can fulfill. There's something about who and what you are that it takes a touch from the Almighty for you to become what you ought to be. It is salvation, but it's more than salvation. It's your very essence. Most folks look at salvation as being saved from something to something. That's all well and good. But my friend, hear me today. You have a destiny. You have an eternity. You have something that you are and you were created for. God made you in his image. None like anything else. And only you can respond to him. An angel cannot respond the way you can. Man is the only creature that we know of that is said to love God. I'd say, preacher, and I thought angels loved God. They may. Gabriel and Michael may love God, but you can't find it anywhere in the Bible where it ever says that an angel loved God, but you do. And I'm going to tell you why you do. You love him because you know him. You love him because of where he brought you from. You love him because of your love that you've experienced from him and you respond to him. You give back to him what he gave to you. That image of God shines forth to you and reflects back to him. That's the whole idea that God made you what you are so that you can reflect back to him. So that there's something greater than a creature that when he looks into you and sees it back in himself, he's made you higher than the angels. Not now, but you will be. Deal with that in a moment. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 2 and verse number 6, the Bible tells you this, God has put within man a destiny reserved only for him. In Hebrews, chapter number 2 and verse 6, the Bible said, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? What is he? I've thought much about it. We're not much, really. As far as strength is concerned, there are many creatures on this earth that are far stronger than we are. As far as intellect is concerned, the angels are greater in power and might than we are. So what is a man? A man is a creature that's made in the image of God. Now watch the answer. Look at the answer in Hebrews chapter number 2. But what is man, he says. In uh, Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 6. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Why bother with him? Or the son of man that thou visiteth him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor. This is the Adam, the first Adam, the one in the garden. He crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of thy hands. Now watch this. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. That word all is all inclusive. All things have been put in subjection under his feet. Now watch this. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. That's a pretty exalted place. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Did you get that? Now just take that part. There's a lot more here, but I don't have all day to preach it. Just take that part. God made a man and put everything under him. He made him a little lower than the angels. And the Lord Jesus Christ shows up in the same context because he, as the second man last Adam, also has a kingdom given to him. And he is our Lord and he is uh, the one that we react, we react to and look like and are of and all these things. But remember this, folks, he made man and put everything under him, man. Now, I don't know how far you can take that. How far would I take it? How great is man? How high are we to be lifted? What destiny does God have for man? He said, I made man in my image. Let us make man in our image. Let's make him in our image and then breathe into him the breath of life. And he went to the extreme to redeem us. He came into this world and went to a cross 2,000 years ago. He went to a cross and there on that cross he bled and he died and he gave himself so he could redeem us. He became the redeemer. Hallelujah to God for redemption. Redemption means to buy back what was his to begin with. He bought us back with his own precious blood. Not by platitudes and promises and, and stuff that have no basis and meaning. He paid for us with his blood. He bought you and he paid for you. The Bible says that there are those that deny the Lord that bought them. You can walk out the door and you can deny him and say, I don't believe in him and I don't be saved, but he still bought you. He paid for you. By the grace of God, he should taste every man. Now watch this. 
man will one day be a judge. Nowhere in the Bible we're told that angels judge seraphim, cherubim, principalities and power, Satan, Lucifer. Nowhere in Scripture are they ever said to be judges. On this earth during this temporal reign, sure they judge, but not in eternity. We will judge angels one day. God's the one that does things like that. Man is literally born of the Spirit of God, a son of God by the new birth, not said of any other. And if you've ever been born again of the Spirit of God, nobody needs to tell you. Amen. Nobody needs to spell it out. Amen. Nobody needs to define what it means. They just look at you and you look at them and you say, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I know what I used to be and I know what I am now and I know what I used to be. I've been born again. You might know all, you might not know all the theological terminology when you got saved, born again, all that. You may not know all. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to be saved. But you know that you've passed from death unto life. Nothing else has been born again. Just man. Just man. Finally, there's coming a day when God will be judged. Romans chapter number 3 and verse 4 says, When thou art judged, there's coming a day when God will be judged. Here's some of the questions. Man is the crowning achievement of God's creation. He'll be the object of God's revelation and righteousness and holiness. God versus evil. Right versus wrong. Wisdom versus ignorance. Humility versus pride. God versus Satan. God will be justified as to why he allowed sin to enter his creation. I don't know if it's ever bothered you. I don't know if you've ever thought about it or not. But he could have stopped sin from ever entering to begin with. Since he allowed it to enter, there's something going on. God will be justified in the creation of man. Why did he make man to begin with, knowing he would fall? Remember this, folks. Sin was here before man was here. That needs to be understood. Man did not bring sin to the earth. Sin was here when man was made. It was already here. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. He was already an enemy of God. Yea, hath God said. So sin, man did, man's not the author of sin. But why did he make man, knowing man would be brought under the condemnation of sin? These are two big questions they're going to judge God by. They're going to judge him one day. The creation's going to judge him. All of his creatures are going to judge him. They're going to judge him in the sense that since you are the almighty, all-wise, all-knowing one, why did you let this happen? What's the answer? What's the answer to that? God will be justified. He will be justified, His glory revealed, His divine wisdom manifested, and all creation will glorify the Lamb. We shall see Him as He is. What's the answer? The answer is God Himself. That once He manifests, him, once he manifests Himself to His creation, once His creation begins to behold Him as He is, once begin to understand who he is and the great purpose he had in making man, the battle of wisdom and ignorance, the battle of righteousness and wickedness, the battle of holiness and profaneness, the battle between good and evil, it rages to this moment. It rages all around you and it rages in your life. Why did God make man? He made him to manifest the fact that one day righteousness will overrule the unrighteous. Holiness will overrule the profane. His wisdom, His mercy, His grace, His graciousness will be manifested one day and all of His creation will all the thing that they'll be able to do is bow their head and say, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. There's a reason for God making man in His own image. One day man becomes the object of all the creatures. 
It's not going to be manifested in angels. It won't be manifested in cherubim. It won't be manifested in seraphim. It won't be manifested in Satan or Lucifer. The wisdom of God will be made known that day in mankind. Yes. He's going to point to you, set you before all creation, and in you, he's going to be justified in every act he has done. Right. Hallelujah to God yeah. for the redeemed, for those that are born again, for those that are saved, for those that started out as a low-down stinking dog, yeah. and now I'm a Mephibosheth. I sit at his table. Yeah. Sit there, I sit at his table. Yeah. He spreads a place for me. Yeah. I came from Lodibar. And now I sit with the glory of God. Man is the only creature that God is able to manifest his wisdom through. And he will do it right now. And I'll close with this statement. Right now, the manifold wisdom of God is being manifested to the creation, the spirit world. They're watching what's happening. And he talks about it in Ephesians that through the church, might be known the manifold wisdom of God. Every one of you in this house this morning were cut down trees, dug out of the ground, placed into the wall, covered up with the wood of the humanity of Christ, and then covered with pure gold, with the deity of the Son of Man. And so when he walks into this house this morning in the temple of God, he walks down the aisles of this place. He doesn't see you nor where you came from. All he sees is the glory of his son manifested forth in every one of us. And that's what creation is about, that God will glorify himself. I'm firmly convinced of that. And it becomes the habitation of God through the Spirit. Father, in thy name I pray.